happy, Ivan, um, my son now. And I just fell in love. I mean, I didn't, I didn't see autism. I see the individual. He has uh, difficulties um, on his daily life. I mean, he's uh, totally dependent because he has no sense of danger. So he will cross the street and, and will put himself in a dangerous situation. And he's non-verbal, so he cannot say anything about, um, I mean, what, how is his feeling, things like that. That creates some frustrations because you cannot express. He's a big motivation now on the translational side. I really want to, to make sure I, my science can, can help him and others like him um, to kind of uh, cope with, with autism in, in daily life and become independent, right? Um, but on the other side, I, I don't want to lose him uh, and my interactions with him. Otherwise, I would be uh, working like 24 hours um, and, and just doing that. But I, I, I want to enjoy his life. And, uh, and that comes a challenge. I mean, how, how you do the same things that we we'll do with, uh, um, we call neurotypical or normal uh, person. But to be honest, I mean, it makes, makes life unpredictable. And I like it. I've <laughs> been enjoying the process. Right. Um, what I would say to other parents, other families is not let the... Um, condition takes over your life, um, but embrace it. I mean, that that's it. I mean, uh, better days will come. I'm highly optimistic about that. Um, but in, until there, I mean, trying to make the best of your life. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Professor Alison Murtry, welcome to the Into the Impossible Studios. Thanks, Brian. Long due. <laughs> yes, it has been overdue. Uh, I don't often get to chat with someone who's literally a rock star and has a grant to prove it. Uh, you are a professor here, a colleague, friend of, of ours here at the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. You've been involved for quite some time. You're a rocket scientist. You're a brain surgeon. You do all these things that people <laughs> say, you know, they can't tell the difference between which is more interesting or difficult. But you do them both, so that's really cool. We're going to talk about rockets, we're going to talk about brains, we're going to talk about everything. Uh, but first I want to give a quick background on who you are, where you came from, your, cool. kind of your origin story. So you're from Brazil originally, as my sister-in-law is. And uh, I wanted to kind of uh, take trace your path from, okay. from South America all the way up to here and to become the leader that you are among many, many other projects. But the ones we're going to be speaking about today involve sending bits of brains into space and actually just studying them here on Earth. So take it away, Alison. All right. Yeah. So I, um, I'm originally from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, my family is a middle class family, oranges from Italy. Um, so we think we are third generation of Italians in, in, in Sao Paulo, in Brazil. Uh, and I was always like a scientist. I didn't know exactly what kind of scientist, but I was always very curious, very into uh, nature and exploring everything. Um, and that, that drove me to do uh, biology, to study biology. Um, so that was um, uh, when I joined the University of Campinas, which is uh, in the countryside of Sao Paulo um, for my undergrad studies. Um, and after that, I, I, I moved straight directly to a PhD program um, at the University of Sao Paulo. This was uh, uh, on, on DNA repair, learning about the DNA metabolism in cells. At that stage, I was already into... Um, Genetics, trying to understand the human genetics. So my PhD was human genetics and potential like gene therapy ways to, to interact with the genome. And that was um, back in 2001. So in 2002, I moved to uh, the Salk Institute to work with Rusty Gage, a good friend, a good mentor. Um, and I learned more about stem cells and neuroscience. Uh, and in 2008, 2009, that's when I got my first faculty position here in U.S. And I decided to, to stay. And I've been here, I mean, for several years now. <laughs> <laughs> and you're in both pediatrics and you're also in... Uh, cellular molecular medicine. Cellular, yeah. And that's a kind of a unique department or division that most universities don't have. So pediatrics, people, you know, should know more right. or less. They were once, you know, seen by such physicians. But what is a cellular and molecular medical department? What is that about? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. And this is uh, very unique to UCSCD. We have within the School of Medicine a very deep fundamental uh, department that studies the molecular level, what happens inside the cells to, I mean, the cell structures itself. Um, and... And it's a, it's a small department, it's a group of people really interested on um, 
basic stuff. Um, so there is no potential application. Of course, I mean, we all diverge and, and it starts working on, on diseases and conditions like that. But uh, most of these guys are really into how the cell works. Mm. And so uh, is, is it helpful that, you know, in the future, we'll be able to actually maybe perhaps avoid certain invasive medical procedures by actually engineering molecules and cells to do the bidding for us? <laughs> yeah, I think that's, um, I mean, I don't think it's no longer science fiction. I think this is uh, uh, on, on the pipeline. Uh, it's just that the tools when we start are not the best ones. I mean, I think you you, you can relate to that. So you, you build something that seems to be working. You have a proof of concept. And then the, it takes several years to, to make that um, uh, something that will go into clinics that people would use every day, that the MDs, the medical doctors will understand. Um, so we're in this process with lots of these tools from gene therapy, from genome editing, um, from the stem cells, from predicting how a tissue cells work. Um, but I think we are in the right path. Mm. So what are organoids? We hear about these, um, these, these objects. It sounds like an organ. Sounds like an android. Uh, <laughs> are, are they? Uh, are they? Uh, you know, sort of more towards the organ or more towards the android? Yeah. So the the, the organoid is really. Um, I mean, from the word, is a, is a small version of the tissue, right? I mean, you have brain organoid, you have lung organoid, you have pancreas organoid. So it's a it's a small miniaturized version of the tissue. Um, it gives you the impression that you you really have like an entire tissue. It's just like a small version, but that's not the case. Usually we have pieces of that tissues that are not um, complete, but uh, good enough uh, to serve as a model. Mm -hmm. um, and there are limitations. I mean, you don't have all the cells, the size is different. Uh, these organoids are not vascularized, and that's one of the main um, limitations why they don't grow even bigger. Um, so, but uh, even with those limitations, they are useful because they are mimicking the organ in a, in a three-dimensional version, um, which is something that we know it, it works, but back in the lab, it's hard to control things in 3D. So we, most of the lab, or I would say like for the past 100 years, people are looking into cells in a two-dimension mm. configuration. And, and more recently, we are applying, it becomes more um, routine to use three-dimensional organoids to study um, how the tissue works. How does an organoid differ from a stem cell, or are they related to each other? They are related, yeah. The, the organoids are, most of the time, I mean, coming from human pluripotent stem cells. And uh, pluripotent stem cells are those stem cells that can make any type of tissue in the body. Mm. So these are your primordial embryonic stem cells uh, back into the blastocyst inside the uterus. That's, that's the first cells that start to differentiate, specialize in the different tissues in the embryo. Mm. So scientists, I mean, learn how to isolate these pluripotent stem cells either from the embryo or more recently from uh, live people and, and, and create these pluripotent stem cells uh, that can be then uh, induced to become the different cell types or different tissues that you want. And um, most of this knowledge is, um, has been um, accumulated over the years um, with the most uh, fundamental basis in embryology, uh, especially mouse embryology, mm -hmm. and we try to apply for it to humans. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, so there is a little bit of um, a trial and error until you figure out exactly what is the formula, the recipe to create a brain organoid and not a pancreas organoid. Mm. So over the time, we're learning how to do this better and better, becoming more reproducible um, and, and, and reliable. Are there you know, more or fewer kind of ethical considerations when it comes to using organoids as opposed to stem cells? I remember when the um, Stanford you know, Consortium and, and the Stem Cell Initiative, which you're a big part of, or we're a big part of, I don't, we'll talk more about that in a bit. But when that first came about, there were you know, a lot of controversy yeah. within and without of the state of California. Are there, as I say, more or, or less kind of concerns, ethically speaking, on the yeah. practice of extraction and, and engineering and utilization of organoids as opposed to stem cells? Right. Yeah. So the, uh, the stem cell field is always with some kind of a controversial, right? I mean, in, and I think the biggest controversial that we're probably alluding to is the use of human embryonic stem cells, because to... Uh, to use those cells requires the destruction of the embryo, and some religious people are against about that. Um, so when I arrived in the US, uh, that was uh, 2001, 2002, that was uh, under the Bush administration, who prohibit to use embryonic stem cells um, with federal grants. Um, so people have to use like private um, funds to work with these cells. Uh, but fortunately, what happens in 2007, 2008, was uh, someone um, 
called uh, Shina Yamanaka, a colleague of mine, uh, was able to show that you can take um, a piece of um, your somatic cells, these are cells that are available, not your germline cells, and reprogram these cells back to this pluripotent state. So by doing that, you avoid um, the use of embryonic stem cells. So that's no longer an issue yeah. um, because we can use these induced pluripotent stem cells now. Um, but also the good news is that by doing that, by reprogramming cells from a specific individual, I capture the genome of that individual. For example, if I now take like a piece of your skin, go back, reprogram into this pluripotent stem state, I can make a brain organoid from you, from Brian. Mm -hmm. And that brain organoid contain your genetic information to show how your brain were formed or was formed during the embryonic. I kind of a replay your embryonic stages uh, in the lab. Oh, wow. We can replay my first kiss with my wife. <laughs> quite attractive, right, honey? Um, so I have a brain here. Uh, this one was don No, this one was not donated by my graduate students. Uh, so it has many different uh, components to it. Uh, right. So, uh, you know, m the only connection I have with the brain is that most people confuse and conflate my name with the word brain. In fact, you did, and I'm saving and printing out that email for posterity. <laughs> or world's foremost expert called me brain. I appreciate that. Um, so here's a brain. Um, there's many different parts. Uh, we don't have to get into all of them. I, I believe it's true, though, that you know the, the frontal cortex, which I think is this side, right? Right. Um, uh, is, is sort of the sine qua non, the most interesting, exciting part about what differentiates you know both the size and the capability of the human brain from bonobos or something else. Um, what what part of the brain is being replicated or or um, uh, modeled by an organoid, or or is it just generic? Because it seems just looking at there's gray matter or white matter. Yeah. Uh, can you you know play yeah. around with it and yeah. let me know where, where is it actually coming from? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, the uh, your frontal cortex is really the the region for the computational capacity, the complexity, your emotions, it all boils down to the frontal cortex. And that's why it's very interesting uh, for scientists and not to understand, not only to understand evolution of the human brain, which is um, kind of cool, um, but also m several diseases have um, problems in the cortex, like mm. autism, schizophrenia. So all these conditions, uh, psychiatric conditions, have uh, problems specific with the frontal cortex. So um, I mean, it's, it's no, no surprise that this was one of the first regions that scientists decided to focus, and we have like good protocols to create um, the frontal cortex. So there are other regions, as, as you pointed out. I mean, you, you have like a nice um, uh, 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 cerebellum here, which is also implicated in, in, in autism, but also help you to coordinate your, your movements. Um, so that is a structure that happens a little bit late in life, mm -hmm. and, and we don't know exactly how it happens in, in humans or, or what are the factors that we need to recreate that perfectly. So the protocol to create like a cerebellar organoid mm -hmm. um, is lacking behind because we are, we are not all that focused on creating that. Mm -hmm. um, but there are other, the striatum is a, it, it's focused for... Um, uh, the dopaminergic neurons, these are the center of dopamine, um, and it's a region that gets damaged. Uh, if you have Parkinson, you lose the dopaminergic uh, neurons inside your brain. Mm. Um, so we are learning how to create these dopaminergic neurons or, or, or brain organoid uh, from the striatum so we could replace that for Parkinson. So you can see how these uh, organoids can also be useful for regenerative medicine um, down the road. Um, some of these clinical trials are already like in the pipeline mm -hmm. and it will be happening soon. So uh, big picture question we've had on people like uh, Sir Roger Penrose, uh, one of the original guests on this podcast. And, uh, and he's uh, been asked by me and many other people, is the brain a computer? Uh, I'd love to get your perspective on that. We're, 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 <laughs> we're on the computational spectrum, is a computer relative to a brain? And what things do they have in common uh, from your perspective? Well, I mean, uh, from, from the simple concept of, of, of a computer, like some, something that you, you add an input and, 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 and gives you like an output with some, some process information, in that sense, I would say yes. Uh, but I think the way the brain computes is kind of quite unique. Mm. And uh, we don't know that yet. And by the way, that's one of the exciting projects that I have here with um, uh, colleagues at UCSCD is to really understand how the brain computes. Mm -hmm. um, and if we do that, uh, then you can imagine, I mean, all, all the kind of a processing that is happening in our minds while we are here talking um, with a very low cost of energy. Mm. And, and to do something with AI would take like 
way more energy and way more computational power to, to execute that. So how come the brain learns how to do that with so low energy? So this is one of the questions that I'm fascinating about to learn how the brain does, how the brain right. learns. It's about 100 watts uh, equivalent uh, yeah. power. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, It's pretty amazing. And it's yeah. a squishy computer. It's a, it's a wet computer, right. which yeah. uh, I don't yeah. want to take my iPhone into that environment uh, <laughs> again, because that'll, you know, invoke Apple care. Um, but the, the notion that, you know, there is this ab ability for now we live in this era where, you know, everybody's using GPT and chat bots and so forth. But I always like to remind people that, you know, the most famous physicist in history, you know, present company excluded, was Albert Einstein. Mm -hmm. And Albert uh, said the happiest thought of his life was that an observer in free fall would not experience a gravitational field. Uh, and that led him to, along the way to the, the what we call the Einstein equivalence principle and other things. But I always point out, you know, to what extent could a computer mm -hmm. replicate the feeling of a happiness to have, oh, it's my happiest thought of my, my uh, you know, my CPU is it was really operating at maximum efficiency. Um, and B, how could it visualize the sensation of free fall? So uh, very curious from your perspective, to what extent can a computer ever potentially replicate what the creative you know, capability is of the, you know, cerebellum or cerebrum of a uh, human being. Do you <laughs> yeah. think it's possible? Will we be replaced with AI, I, AEs like Albert Einstein? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, from, and may, maybe, I mean, if we have, if we ever had like a computer that might process information as the brain, let, let, let's suppose that, that we have now, I think it would be able to articulate that as long as you teach them. Mm. What what is the feeling of happiness, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you have to teach a computer Train how to do it. that. <laughs> yeah, but uh, when, once you do that, I think it will be able to learn and 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 apply to different conditions that are similar. Um, having like this sensation of uh, feeling or doing good um, based on other previous sensation, which is more or less how the brain does as well. Right. Um, I had a friend in college. Uh, I won't give his name because he is a listener out there. How you doing out there? I won't say his name, uh, but he's uh, his father was an, uh, an orthodontist, okay. and he had braces for eleven years. And you know, it's kind of cruel that you know his father basically was using him for experimentation. Uh, now I understand that both the first you know organoid, uh, some of the first organoid, organoid material perhaps came from a father who had a son uh, with autism. Uh, and I understand that your stepson also has autism. So there's a personal angle. Yeah. I wonder if you could explore that. What is it? I mean, I'm a father of of, of many children, um, you know, and 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 I've been involved with the Simons Foundation, who supports a tremendous amount of autism research through their Safari program. Uh, talk, first of all, what is it? What is it like? Um, having yeah. a child uh, with autism uh, and you know are there any tips uh, we have a lot of uh, listeners who, who do have uh, children on different varieties of the neural uh, divergence but uh, in particular on autism so I wonder could you you know kind of uh, uh, share your experience as, as a father yeah. um, and and uh, of your son and then we'll get into the scientific you know experimentation yeah. that we'd love to do in our kids. right 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 <laughs> uh, I mean that let me step back on this story uh, first because I was in studying autism way before him. Mm. Um, and uh, the major motivation at the time was really to understand um, how the human brain evolved. Um, if you look around the other species, I mean, you don't really see um, they are trying to get to the moon, right? I mean, they're not doing anything like that. Um, and there are no evidence that the Neanderthals, which would be like really close to us, yeah. would do the same thing, even mm. though they have been on Earth for longer than us. Um, but there is no evidence that they were in that level of sophistication, um, in the, the debatable about all, all these reasons. Um, but that was I was trying to understand why, what happens to the human brain that make us so unique. Um, and that led me to study autism because one of the key components of being human is your social ability, the way that we talk, communicate, interact with others. And we can do that um, in a high order of magnitude compared to other primates who are limited on that um, amount of connections that they can make and deal mm -hmm. in a daily basis. So we, we, we can surpass the chimpanzee um, by three times, I believe. Um, so, and, and then autism was, 
a one way where this system is not functioning well because autistic individuals tend to be more introspective um, and make less social contact. So I went to study autism. At the same time, I mean, there's, a, there's another syndrome called Williams syndrome, mm. and it's a deletion in chromosome 7 that makes you hypersocial. Mm. So in a way, it's a, in a very simplistic way, it's an opposite of autism. So these are people that are attracted to new faces, attracted to strangers. Um, so I was dealing with those uh, two syndromes, um, and, and by studying them, I mean, you, you make discoveries. And one of the discoveries that we did was that um, the alterations that we see in the autistic brains are not permanent, which is, was a, a major dogma in neurosciences. Um, people would think that alterations during early development uh, would stay there forever. And I think we, we have to revisit that idea. I think some of these syndromes are, are reversible. And um, so we made that discovery using like stem cells. And, uh, and, and, and then I went for a talk in Brazil and that's how I met my wife. Mm. Uh, and she was there as a mom with someone with autism. <coughs> and um, so that's, uh, that's then, then we met, we start the conversation and, and then I met Ivan. Um, my son now, and I just fell in love. I mean, I didn't, I didn't see autism. I see the individual, and Ivan is quite severe. I mean, he's a, uh, um, he has um, uh, difficulties um, on his daily life. I mean, he's uh, totally dependent. Um, I, I, I joke, but it's not a joke that if if we leave him unattended for one hour, he will die because mm. he has no sense of dangers. He will cross the street and, and will put himself in a dangerous situation. And he's non-verbal, so he cannot say anything about, um, I mean, what, how is his feeling, things like that. That creates some frustrations because you cannot express. Um, but um, over the years, I mean, um, um, uh, living together and, and learning how to do it, I think um, I put that aside. And of course, and he's a big motivation now on the translational <coughs> side. I really want to, to make sure I my science can can help him and others like him um, to kind of uh, cope with with autism in, in daily life and become independent, right? Um, but on the other side, I, I don't want to lose him uh, and my interactions with him. Otherwise, I would be uh, working like 24 hours um, and, and just doing that. But I, I, I want to enjoy his life. And, uh, and that comes a challenge. I mean, how, how you do the same things that we would do with, uh, um, we call neurotypical or normal uh, mm -hmm. person, right? I mean, going to a restaurant. Um, it's complicated. You never know how he's going to react, how long he will last. And sometimes, yeah, sometimes he will not last a minute. <laughs> uh, we sit down and then I mean, he starts uh, becoming agitated and we have to leave or, or the food arrives and we have to pack and leave. I mean, there are all these uncertainty. But, but to be honest, I mean, it makes, makes life unpredictable and I like it. I've <laughs> been enjoying the process. Right. Um, what I would say to other parents, other families is not let the um, condition takes over your life. Um, but embrace it. I mean, that, that's it. I mean, uh, better days will come. I'm highly optimistic about that. Um, but in, until there, I mean, trying to make the best of your life. Yeah, it's interesting just hearing you describe it that way. Um, Aristotle, you know, was, was wrong about most things in physics, but he was right about almost everything else, <laughs> including the laws of logic and even philosophy and, and theatrics and so forth. But he uh, speculated on why why is it that children love their parents more than uh, sorry why is it that parents love their children more than children love their parents, and after a long you know kind of meandering uh, the set of discussions, he he basically comes up with the fact that well parents sacrifice for the child but it's usually unidirectional it's we don't expect our kids to sacrifice their time their effort their money their you know their, all their resources for us uh, at least when we're you know in, in the kind of yep. age bracket that you and I are in uh, later on in life we hope that they'll take care of us uh, as we become more dependent on them and sort of symmetrical so the extrapolation that later you know philosophers and, and psychologists described was that, well, the more you sacrifice, the more you love. And, and in case of parents with, with children with special needs, but also have children that don't have special needs, as you say neurotypical, yeah. I guess is the right phrase, um, there's almost more of an attachment to the child that has the, um, the, the special needs because yeah. you do have to sacrifice so much. And it is so admirable that you have um, not only the dedication that you obviously do, but the, the cheerful attitude. And I, I think that's, that's really touching. And I want to uh, ask when you um, when you first made an organoid, were, were you the first to to kind of think of these ideas and, and how you could apply them, or you you mentioned your mentor uh, or like a colleague at, at Salk uh, was it Kate? Uh, Kate? 
Yeah, Rusty, Rusty Gage. Rusty yeah. Gage, yeah. That's a cool name uh, made up of two different, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, two different English words. Uh, can you uh, explain what, what is the, uh, the genesis of the organoid phenomenon? Was it, when did it start and when did you get the organoid bug, so to speak, yeah. or were they coincident? <laughs> yeah. No, that, that's a great question. And, um, and again, I mean, the, 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 the stem cell history goes, goes really back to, um, to the 70s when people were ex- ex- were experimenting with uh, brain tissues, even some biopsies, and, and putting them in culture. And some of these uh, brain tissues were already in 3D, and they were observing that, wow, 3D is um, there's more activity. I mean, the neurons behave differently. The complexity of the neurons is much different than what we are used to see in 2D. Uh, but that's that's taken directly from the brain or from the mouse or from the human and, and, and placed into the lab. Nobody has recreated that from the beginning. Mm-hmm. I think that's that's the differentiation. Um, the first guy who actually did that um, was uh, another well, fantastic Japanese investigator called Yoshiki Sasai. That was in 2008. That mm-hmm. That's when I was starting my lab. Right. And I remember reading that publication. And by the way, he didn't call it a brain organoid or anything. He was just like describing how he would do it. And I said, oh, my gosh, I mean, he can actually create like a fetal brain tissue that remarkably looked like a fetal brain tissue using stem cells. Um, That's so cool. That's what I want to do it in my lab. So it was right in the beginning. um, But as I mentioned, I mean, the protocols were not robust enough. I mean, we were trying, we were failing. Um, It was so much easier to get it going with the traditional uh, two-dimensional cultures um, that people were like really getting frustrated. Um, But then more and more people in the stem cell field uh, were joining uh, and realizing how important it would be to kind of uh, uh, improve that method. And over the past 10 years, we see really um, uh, a, a gigantic effort on, on, on recreating these and make it more reproducible, characterizing them better, um, understanding the limitations, overcoming the limitations. So this is all happening in the past um, uh, 10 years. Um, to me, uh, a crucial moment um, was when we, we were optimizing the cortical uh, protocol uh, to make like a piece of a human cortex in, in a dish. Um, and we were frustrated because the protocols, including the protocol from Sasai, when we tried to record the electrical activity of those neurons, um, the activity was quite low, very low activity, um, meaning that there was something missing in, in the recipe. And, and, and everybody seems okay with that um, because the organoids were already like providing you with the structure. You could study cell migration, things like that. But I was into the network because right. that's how the brain computes, right? right? Uh, and that's the problem with autism and schizophrenia is not much about the malformations of the brain, but rather how the connections are formed. Mm. So I wanted to get that down. So I, I asked like a postdoc of mine to really put like an effort on optimizing and starting from scratch, looking at uh, the culture media that we use, how many salts are there. And then we realized that everybody was, was using the wrong osmolarity to grow human neurons. So we fixed that. Um, and we were fixing like pieces by pieces mm-hmm. um, until we had like some um, very simple formula where we remove more things than we add. And it seems to work beautifully. And then, I mean, they played that on a multi-electrode array. So this is um, electrodes that are printed in a bottom of a dish. And you plate your organoid on top of it. And uh, the electrodes will capture the electrical activity. And usually, as I mentioned, we saw very little activity here and there. Um, and others have tried to do the same thing with organoids and, 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 and didn't see um, much as well. But then, I mean, in the beginning, uh, the first week or so, we see a little bit more, but not, not striking. Um, but as the days were passing, <laughs> we saw that the electrical activity started to almost exponentially jumping. And uh, I said, I can't believe it. This is like a malfunction machine. I mean, check your electrodes. I mean, go back because, I mean, nobody would buy this, right? And this postdoc, he was um, uh, Kleber Trujillo. He's a, uh, now a friend of mine. He's saying, no, no, it's real. It's real. We reproduced that many times. And I said, all right. I mean, that, if that's real, that, that will change something. Because, I mean, having a tissue that um, start to have that level of activity um, and, and never seen before was unprecedented uh, in, in, in science um, made me think about, well, maybe we are recreating the right connections in the brain. And to show that, we've, we team up with uh, Brad Wojtek, mm-hmm. um, who is um, also a colleague and faculty here at the Cognitive Neurosciences, and he showed us how to evaluate those networks to measure these brain oscillations, which is something that you can see um, with EEG. Um, so uh, 
and, and then we realized that um, these organoids were mimicking this uh, preterm development up to postnatal development. So we can actually keep them alive for several years. Um, the electrical activity was, uh, was growing up uh, for 40 weeks and then plateau when they reach about nine months of age. Mm. Um, which is the gestational time for, for humans. And is that says, just a coincidence or is that... I, it, could, it could be. We are still trying to figure out if it's just a coincidence because I, my initial reaction was, no, this will never happen because it's, it's a tiny thing. The organoid has 5 million neurons. Mm -hmm. uh, human brain has 86 billion neurons. So these are orders of magnitude. Um, but, um, but then, I mean, we did it. We used all, all the controls. We eventually published that. And it's right. Um, so what does it mean? It means that uh, the brain um, can have a, a kind of a, a miniaturized version of itself that can reproduce itself. So it's like a fractal. It's a scale. Exactly. Scale yeah. And, yeah. and the synapses are as well, right? Yeah. The networking, yeah. right? Otherwise, the communication is almost impossible if it doesn't, if it relies on each individual unique personality of each neuron, yeah. it probably wouldn't have survived evolutionarily. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that brings me to uh, to a, a question that you are involved with evolution. You mentioned Neanderthals earlier today. Um, uh, so I wonder, is it true you created a Neanderthal brain, you know, <laughs> <laughs> deep underground in your in your laboratory? Up there? I, I don't make make it over to the medical school very often, but uh, explain this the Neanderthal uh, mini brain that's hypothesized to come uh, from you. Just a quick pause to ask you for a small favor while my thumb is occupied with old Albert on it. Yours is presumably freed up to leave a thumbs up on this video. It really helps me a lot with a good old fashioned YouTube algorithm. Thanks a lot. Now back to the video. Yeah, no, no, it, it, it is. Um, uh, the, it's not a Neanderthal brain. To create a Neanderthal brain, you would need a Neanderthal cell. And and we know that um, right now there is no cells available from the Neander Neanderthals. You can get their bones, and from their bones you can extract their DNA. So going back to that idea that um, um, maybe our brains are unique um, because they are different from other species, what we did was uh, to align the genome of the Neanderthals with um, the modern humans, us. And we ask the following question. Um, what is unique about us? What are the genetic variants that we only have and no other species, even the Neanderthals, have them? And uh, we end up with a list of uh, 61 protein coding genes. There are more variations in the other regions of the genome, but for the uh, protein coding genes, there are only 61. And those genes are interesting. I mean, these are genes related to bone formation, the immune system, uh, but there are a couple of them related to brain development. Um, so what we decided to do to study the impact of those specific uh, genetic variants was to use genome editing technology to neanderthalize the human genome. So we did that in one of the pluripotent stem cells. What um, does neanderthalize involve? So it means that uh, we can use, for example, a CRISPR enzyme or, or some genome editing enzyme uh, to change the DNA from humans, uh, from me, from you, mm -hmm. and add uh, the sequence of a Neanderthal inside the cell. But you don't have the brain. So in other words, you can isolate that which would become the brain from the bone DNA and then use that to forecast, or you can see how similar you can get to a Neanderthal bone um, DNA or whatever um, using CRISPR enzyme technology. That's well, it. Yeah, That's okay. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the DNA, I mean, should be identical in all you know your cells, right? I mean, but we yeah. we take from the bones from the Neanderthal. There's a sequence over there which includes the brain, which includes the nose, exactly where the yeah. ear should go. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that specific gene, the gene is called Nova One. Um, mm -hmm. It's an interesting name. Mm -hmm. uh, that specific gene, which is a master regulator of downstream uh, hundreds of other genes, um, it's different between us and the Neanderthals. Yeah. So we went to Nova One and we swapped the uh, modern version of the gene that we have by the Neanderthal version of the gene. And then from that pluripotent stem cells, then we create a brain organoid. So that brain organoid will have that protein that is not a modern human protein, but is a Neanderthal yeah. protein. And how it will downregulate all the other genes that are supposed to do that. Yeah. And, um, and it, it, it did in a very different way. Huh. And that was a big surprise because um, even the morphology of the brain looks slightly different. Um, uh, we see uh, alterations in cell migration and proliferation. Um, but the most interesting aspect to me is that when we record the electrical activity of the Neanderthalized brain organoid, um, it shows a, a maturation much faster 
than a modern human. Hmm. So, and that that mimics well, that goes well with this um, this idea that uh, we are really um, slow developers, hmm. right? I mean, um, a baby chimpanzee can outsmart a human baby. Right. right. They are born, they already know how to jump the trees mm-hmm. and then find food. <laughs> um, our babies requires attention, way more attention. So, when we neanderthalized uh, the human brain uh, organoid, the maturation of these networks resemble much more the chimpanzee. Hmm. So, most likely, I mean, you can extrapolate, this is just speculation, I mean, there's no way to prove that, that maybe the networks of uh, the cortex of the Neanderthal would mature faster than, um, than us. So, that mutation um, that we acquire, and it's almost fixed in the human population, um, makes every single brain develop its law. Interesting. <laughs> so, I wonder um, if you could uh, kind of join me on a speculative uh, fictional, because we are you know, part of the Arthur C. Clarke Center. For, right. uh, we got to pay homage to Sir Arthur. Uh, and I haven't really formed this question very well in my own brain, but uh, but let me, let me try it out on you, and we can always edit it out later if it doesn't make sense. Um, so, there's Claims, I, I can't remember exactly the figure, but something like 99.7% similarity between humans and chimpanzees. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Neanderthals, obviously. And I don't remember which came first, Denisovans or Neanderthals, but but the um, the, the historian and uh, kind of uh, demographer Yuval Noah Harari has made a case that Homo sapiens emerged superior because we had the ability to construct language and complex uh, thoughts and storage. And it wasn't because of our strength, because probably, I mean, chimpanzees are probably a lot stronger than us. And uh, possibly even Denisovans and so forth were stronger. But it was the capability for language. Now, I wonder, you know, if we could maybe ask you to speculate, is it is it sort of a chicken or the egg thing? We don't know um, which came first, the, the brain development the physical capacity the hardware of the brain or the software you know to run the language right. app to run the you know the history app etc the art app um what 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 is it what is that missing 0.3 percent where, where is it is it pure hardware is it pure dna what, what do you think and i don't know this is speculative yeah but. Uh, it most likely a combination of both right mm-hmm. but i i do think that without the hardware we will not be there or will not be here mm-hmm. <laughs> um so it means that we we need to acquire uh the set of mutations that would make our brain susceptible to language, to socialization, um, much higher than the other species. And I think this is a set of um, mutations that we acquire in the DNA that prove to be um, a positive because we are all selected for that um, over the years. So there are many missing things. I mean, how these mutations emerge in the first place, it could be random, but how do you fix them in the population? There is probably like a, a, a strong selective pressure to fix them. And, um, and, and, and those we don't know. I mean, probably for each one of these mutations, we have like a huge history behind it. Um, and it's the same way, it's the same time, type of uh, speculation that people are doing um, on, on the other way around. For the sequences of the Neanderthal that we now have in our genome, not the ones that we don't have, but the ones that we have. Mm. And um, it's becoming clear that there are sequences that make us susceptible to diabetes. Um, COVID-19, mm-hmm. those are some of the sequences that uh, we acquire from the Neanderthals for mm-hmm. probably uh, reasons of adaptation to the environment. Um, but there are things, for example, um, uh, uh, addiction to nicotine seems mm-hmm. to come in from, from the Neanderthals. Why? Why, 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 why is that? So, w- I mean... Yeah. We can we can create hypotheses, but nobody knows. Interesting. I'm listening to a book and uh, possibly helping to have the the author on of a book called The Mind of a Bee, uh, which is a really fascinating book so far. It's it's one of the few books that I can listen to with my kids. You know, I start listening to a book. It was called Salt, a History of Salt. And mm-hmm. I'm like, God, this has got to be totally, you know, kosher. <laughs> My kids got to, and it's all about sex and like how, sa- you know, salad. It- anyway, I don't want to get into it. <laughs> but this book, The Mind of the Beast, so far as of, you know, uh, chapter four is is quite, uh, quite remarkably, you know, G-rated. So I love that. Uh, but one of the cases that they make are that the author, I think his name is Lars. I forget his last name. Anyway, we'll have, hopefully have him on Lars if you're listening out there. Uh, the, the, you know, kind of idea that honey was 
is the most natural nutrient rich, you know, kind of material with high calories and caloric intake yeah. that was actually used by Neanderthals and Denisovans and whatever, going back to pre-recorded history uh, and their, you know, cave paintings and, you know, where to find it and so forth. Uh, but he obviously goes through the famous, you know, Nagelian exercise of what's it like to be a bat, in this case, what's it like to be a bee. Um, but I wonder, you know, this, uh, the caloric in needs of, of a Neanderthal versus a, versus a modern day human. And, and you mentioned uh, things like diabetes and, and Parkinson's. Can we someday envision taking an organoid, which I, I think you might have brought some organoid uh, you know, material with you. Here, yeah. um, so <laughs> I was hoping I could take that into my lab down the hall and uh, and and start working on an, on an upgrade. I, I'm due for an upgrade. My, my hardware is a little <laughs> bit out of date. I need I need a new uh, new new hardware, not just new software. Um, can you envision a day when? There are materials, there are augmentations, not like Neuralink, which I want to discuss yeah. with you later on, yeah. but you could actually have a plug-in, you know, kind of a, uh, upgrade or a replacement and augment and, and you know, even achieve super intelligence, uh, as past guest Nick Bostrom has talked about. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point. I have uh, mixed feelings about that because um, there are, I mean, sometimes, I mean, if you, if you pay attention, nature gives you answers. Mm -hmm. um, there are cases of people who are... Um, who have their brains fused. Uh, these are twins, people who are, who are born with like the brains fused, right? Um, and there is no evidence that um, they are exceptionally smart. Right. Um, so I, I, I don't think that adding neurons or, or, or <laughs> adding things in there would, would make a difference. Um, but, but it might be there are instances where, for example, maybe if we learn how memories are stored and then you can create um, some kind of... Uh, outside the brain to store specific memories that you could right. retrieve with your thought. Or, or take the organoids of a bee, which has these, you know, electro, you know, thermal sensors and the ultraviolet sensitivity, which we don't have, and yeah. just, you know, have that as your package. And oh, then oh could, yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. by the way, that's, uh, that's the beauty of the organoid, because you can, you can explore those things. Um, and, and in a similar way that we are looking to the past, looking for genes of Neanderthals, things like that, we are also looking to the future. So we are, we are using these uh, genome editing technologies to recreate senses in the brain uh, that we either lost or we never had. Mm. Um, uh, oh, like what? Give me an example. Um, magnetic perception. Ah. Um, mm -hmm. We have the genes, but they're heavily mutated. Um, so mm -hmm. other mammals can, can, can probably sense that better than us. Mm -hmm. uh, whales is a great example. I mean, yeah. that's how they, they move around. Um, but we lost that. So a blind person um, in a forest will, will starve and die. Right. Um, so why? I mean, probably there's a selective pressure to lose those, those senses, um, but they are there. So we can use like genome editing to reconstruct wow. that and <laughs> test if the brain organoids now can sense, um, can sense magnetism. Well, it would be yeah. cool to see if we can sense polarized light. There are uh, animals that are very sensitive to polarization. Yeah. I study the polarization in the microwave background. I'm not going to get into that. But yeah, to augment the senses, not just to have more is better because uh, it, it's not exactly, as you say, clear that yeah. just having more. Um, I mentioned uh, Neuralink, and I'd love to get your opinions. We've got his, uh, you know, SpaceX mugs here, Elon. So don't <laughs> don't think we're hating on you. Uh, we we paid great, you know, full full retail price for these. Um, tell me, what are your thoughts about Neuralink, and um, you know, kind of the 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 opportunities, and maybe some of the risks of, of such a such a technology? Yeah, I and I'll, I'll be honest that I'm not fully immersed on on what Neuralink is is doing. Um, but I have like a vague idea of uh, what 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 Neuralink and others are are trying to do, um, and I think my, I mean, when I see the uh, magical side of it, I like it. Yeah. Um, for example, can you imagine if you, if those electrodes that you are implanted there can block seizures? Yeah. Um, my son has uh, hundreds of seizures per day, so if I can stop that, or or even himself, or by by touching himself or by by thinking could stop the seizures when it's approaching, that would be fantastic. Um, uh, uh, rehabilitation, this interface, um, if you lose a member and um, uh, a hand or something and you can use like electrodes implemented in your, in, in your brain to kind of a move like a, a robotic arm, mm -hmm. things like that. I, that I like it. Mm -hmm. um, for, for normal average person um, trying to mess up with your brain, I worry a little bit um, because, I mean, there is a reason why it's so protected. Yeah, right. <laughs> Probably don't mess up with the brain. Um, and, but that's my, my worry. If we, if we find ways to do that, um, that is uh, non-invasive, even better. And I think these are the discussions that 
that some people have. Um, there are some people that prefer to use EEGs to capture the electrical activity. Of course, I mean, in, in, in neuroscience, it's all about how close to the action you are. I mean, right. the closer you are to the neurons, the better. Right. And that's why people want to stick electrodes in there. In the actual. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But there is a risk associated with that. Yeah. 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 So former uh, UCSD professor, now uh, Stanford professor Andrew Humerman, who hopefully we'll have on the podcast at some point, um, he, uh, he has made the point that the eyes or the retina is really a part of the brain that's outside of the cranial vault, which you did you know, suggest is the, you know, kind of the armor that protects this really vital organ. Um, would there be work to, you know, that seems to be, as you say, the most accessible and then um, uh, and then perhaps most medically therapeutic or beneficial to restore sight or things like mm -hmm. that. Are there subspecialties within the work that you're doing to grow new retinal cells. And again, I don't know all the diseases. I know there's, you know, RP and all these different um, uh, destructive and degenerative diseases of the eye and the retina. Is that a focus, focus no pun intended, of, of your research? It is, it is. Um, uh, we are uh, creating like retina uh, organoids, um, and I do that in collaboration with another professor here at UCSCD in, in ophthalmology called Walling. Um, so his lab ex is, is an expert in, in, in retinas. So we use the stem, the stem cells. From the same stem cells, we create a retina and we create a thalamus because between the retina, between the eye and the brain, there's a thalamus there. And then your cortex, where, where um, the photoreceptors uh, will actually um, uh, uh, send the information. Um, and, and we put those three pieces together. So we have the retina sending the photoreceptors to the thalamus, uh, crossing over the thalamus and now uh, sending connections to and the cortex. Like in the front of the brain? It, it, that would be, yeah, so that's the, the interesting uh -huh. part. I mean, this <laughs> is, um, these are the organoids, how they look like. So you can see that um, there are tiny white balls in there. Uh -huh. Yeah. Those aren't bubbles then. Yeah. No. We'll, we'll get closer pictures. You get, get cl yeah. Wow. So when we make these uh, cortical organoids, there is no uh, identity to them. They, and, and this is an interesting concept. Wow, um, like blank, blank slates. Wow. I call it a blank, a blank canvas, yeah. right? I mean, they can be anything. <laughs> yes. um, and it's different from, from, from the brain that is formed with you. I mean, mm. this is without the body, right? When we have a brain with the body, you're already receiving contacts from other regions, sensory information that shapes, oh, this is a visual cortex, this is a motor cortex. And, um, and as you grow up, those regions become with a higher identities. Even anatomically, you can distinguish them, the morphology, the type of neurons. So when we make a cortical organoid, it's an empty canvas, there is nothing there. But now we want to plug the retina. So will they become like more retina-like? Um, can we uh, stimulate, visually stimulate the retina and record from the cortex? Can we store memories in there? So these are the kind of questions that, that we, are, we, are, we are making. And there are conditions where um, all the pieces are correct. And I forgot, I'm blanking the name of the, the condition right now. Um, but the photo receptors, um, their axonal projections are not getting there for some reason. Mm. So we plan to study that condition as well. Oh. Uh, can you describe, I mean, is it is it understood the process by which a memory is formed and by which it's read out? Uh, I know basic things, you know, dopamine is sometimes involved and strings that involve survival, you know, food finding, things like yeah. that. But, but you know, how does it actually work at a computational level? Do or do we not understand that? We always see these neural networks, and you know, here's a picture of you know learning it and training it, and now it knows a cat versus a dog. But but what's how do you how does the brain actually read a memory, store it? You know, it's not a zero or a one uh, like a computer chip. So how does it actually store a memory, and then how do we actually retrieve a memory? Yeah. So I I think the best answer is we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that's the best one. So that that's for someone to get we'll a Nobel yeah. Prize. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> no, but uh, I. I think the, uh, I mean, we, we all know that this is all so fast and happens uh, so efficiently. So it doesn't seem to be um, uh, in, in a cell or in a synapses. It could be like phosphorylation of proteins, a process that happens uh, much faster. Um, if we think that this is all material related, because it might, I mean, there are people who doesn't even believe that um, those processes happen in a material side. It may might happen on an electrical side. 
Um, and I haven't seen any good arguments against or, or for that. Um, it's still like really open question. Wow. But that's exactly the questions that I want to get with the organoids. Awesome. Uh, because I have the experimental model. Uh, in the past, we're, I mean, we have to do it in a mouse, but the, right. the mouse is very different right. from that. Yeah. Yeah. There's a meme on the internet, you know, whenever somebody makes a discovery of some new drug or something, and it says, just say mouse, you know, in, in mice. In <laughs> mice, yeah. For us, it's, you know, just say dust, because, you know, dust is really the, the mouse of the uh, of the astronomical uh, world. Now, speaking of space and things in the astronomical kingdom, you were involved with the uh, mission from uh, sponsored in, in part, supported by, in part by NASA to the International Space Station. Now, I've had the, the honor and distinction to have on uh, not only a NASA astronaut, but a NASA astronaut alumna of UC San Diego. Not only that, but while she was on the International Space Station, that's Dr. Jessica Meir, who hoping will be the first woman on the moon uh, in the next five years or less. Um, so talk about the board's mission, the Brain Organoid uh, uh, Advanced Research Development in Space mission. What is it? What's your involvement? What was the origin of that particular mission? Yeah, no, that's a, that's another great project, uh, and it always starts with conversation with a good friend of uh, of, of mine that is a it's a common friend here, Eric Fihe, um, and Eric has this interest in space and is always asking me about, I mean, what are the consequences of um, uh, space or what's the impact of space in, in the brain? And we know from NASA twins experiments and other experiments that was done in mouse in cells. Um, that this space environment, either microgravity or together with uh, space radiation, um, is not really the the environment that the brain was uh, made. Uh, any any cells, human cells, are not supposed to be there. Um, so when you expose yourself to that environment, there are consequences. Some of these consequences to the astronauts can be reversible. Um, others are not. Um, and, and, and the brain is particularly important um, because uh, we've seen um, in the animals and in, in, in humans as well uh, some potential cognitive decline. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, bad news uh, for NAS and anybody who wants to do like um, interplanetary exploration or, or long uh, uh, flights. Um, how would you keep the brain uh, protected? So... Uh, that was one of the questions that we had um, uh, to to start working on this project. Um, well, I mean, it's hard uh, to analyze the brain of the astronaut when it comes back. You cannot um, make a row in there and, and look for the synapses, what happens, <laughs> right? I mean, it's all um, uh, post-mortem, waiting for the astronaut to die so it can have access to the tissue. Um, but it's not going to be real time. Um, so, but an organoid can be a proxy of the astronaut mm -hmm. uh, in the space station, and that was um, the idea. Okay, let's send brain organoids to the space station, and let's let's see what happens. So, that was um, kind of uh, the uh, space colonization idea. I mean, let's see w what happens with the brain, how to mitigate the process. Mm -hmm. So, it would help NASA, would help the astronaut. Um, in parallel, there is another thing that um, Eric and I were, were also very interested in is um, what happens to human neurodevelopment in space. Um, we read all these uh, science fiction books talking about uh, people living in other uh, planets, um, but we never ask ourselves, are we, can we cope um, from the beginning, from the embryogenesis um, to uh, microgravity? What kind of a human, what kind of a human brain would have? Um, and, and, and that was um, the first picture that we took from the organoids inside the space station. It already shows that um, the organoids, the way they were growing was slightly different. So there was perfect spheres. So if you see the organoids here, they're not perfect. I mean, they are right. unperfect, right? Right. But, um, but over there, it was amazing. We said, oh my gosh, they actually shape in a ball. Um, wow. And um, so if you, if you have a baby in space, maybe their brains will, will develop in a in a different shape. Hmm. Um, and we don't know the consequences of that, but uh, probably not, not so good. So I'll, I'll think twice about having a baby in this space. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it may be more uh, likely for you than me, given my wife's cut, cut us off. Uh, no more kids. Um, now, the uh, the microgravity environment, of course, is unique to a handful of people. And, I, and uh, I'm curious because, you you know, we spoke about the obvious, the, the relationship in autism and, and your personal connection there. I understand you also uh, study another uh, condition called Pitt-Hopkins syndrome. Yeah. That is, you know, reputed to afflict only 500 people around the world, which is, you know, Okay, it's more than the number of astronauts, but but we're talking about low numbers statistics, and I'm just curious what what drives you to study things like this. Where 
the the you know it's not going to make you billions and billions of dollars you're not going to patent something that's you know going to make you uh make you the richest guy on earth but um there must be something else that drives you to study things that were other scientists either don't tread because they might be motivated like me by more venal considerations or <laughs> or just the time and the pressure and research but tell talk a little bit about uh about what the the interest both in studying this pit uh, Hodgkin syndrome and also studying things that would afflict you know 30 people in the NASA Artemis program at most. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's a great question. Uh, I mean, from the for these uh, rare orphan uh, syndromes, uh, I was always attracted to that because um, uh, the idea is that um, they are they are telling you something. I mean, all these uh, syndromes have specific genes that are mutated or or uh, in affects how the brain works. So by by studying them. Uh, the mutants and and in genetics that's what we do we always study the mutants to understand the normal mm -hmm. um so that was uh, the first um drive so let's me understanding all these genes what are these genes doing so i can understand how the brain works um and uh, so that was the main motivation uh the the board's mission i mean for for the astronauts so there is a there is another motivation behind all of that which is um to help uh to treat diseases that are uncurable here on Earth. And I'll, I'll give you one example. One thing that we are learning with this uh, mission in space is that um, a little time under microgravity, um, when you are back to Earth, your cells age faster. Mm. Yeah. So this is a phenomenon that has been reproducible in different systems. Um, and nobody has done in the brain because we didn't have uh, brain cells in there. But we see that in the organoids as well. So if we can now age the brain cells, uh, I can use this organoid to study other types of conditions that are not pediatric or neurodevelopmental conditions, but are conditions that happens later in life. Like um, Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's, dementia, yeah. things like that. Mm -hmm. So now suddenly we have a model that I can age the cells really fast um, by just sending them to space and come back. Mm. And I have a model for Alzheimer's. Wow. So that's where we are now. Talk about the um, the future of things like Space Tango, Cube Lab program, and, and the board's mission. Will there be another board's mission uh, and so forth? What What is uh, the future of the space uh, investigation? Yeah, so um, we are very fortunate here at UCSCD because um, uh, we received like a, a, a donation from Danny Sanford, who has been our cheerleader here for, for stem cells. And uh, with this new donation, um, it will allow us to expand this, uh, the board project across other disciplines. So now we have colleagues sending hematopoietic blood stem cells mm. to space, um, liver uh, cells to space, um, and for all kinds of different projects. So we are expanding that. And we're also making um, partnership with um, the big players that might have commercial um, space stations um, down the road, Sierra Space, um, Axiom Space. Um, and we continue to work with um, the companies that make the logistic, the, um, the hardware for these uh, cells to, to grow, like Space Tango has been a partner from, from the beginning. So we are, uh, I think in the, in the next um, year or so, um, this program will start really to slowly expand, 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 and it, it might become something like really an institution here at UCSD. Yeah, it's such a remarkable kind of uh, series of projects that you're involved with. It's, it's, it's so exciting, and like Eric, it makes me want to be involved in it, but you can only do <laughs> so much time in a day. <clears throat> Uh, before we wrap up here, and you've generously agreed to let us uh, pry into your lab and take some footage over there uh, later, which will fold in and uh, and kind of a part two of this interview, or maybe maybe uh, append it to this conversation. I want to talk about you know brain health and in particular pediatrics. Um, what you know, kind of your, in terms of your routine, do you have any sorts of of tips or hacks or things that you do? Um, to kind of optimize your brain to prevent neurodegenerative things in the future, potentially. Obviously, these are, you know, not this is not medical advice at this point. Uh, you should not take medical advice from an astrophysicist, anyway. Uh, but but anyway, are, are there things that you do personally? Supplements? Are there things that we can do, especially um, in particular for those of us with young children? Are there things that are particularly important? Yeah, yeah, I. I uh, I'm, I'm in school of medicine, but I, I avoid hospitals. <laughs> so I try to be as healthy as possible, not, not to go there. Um, and um, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't follow any specific diet or anything like that, but I try to be conscious of everything that I do, everything that I eat. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think the most important aspect um, to me on my health is uh, physical exercise, is to, do, uh, to take your time to do at least like one hour 
per day or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and it could be surfing, could be running, could be walking, but just to keep the body moving. Uh, moving. I think that's, um, it works for me. I mean, it keeps me healthy. And I, I realize when I travel too much or in, when I'm so busy that I'm kind of uh, skipping those days, um, um, that's when I feel miserable. <laughs> so I need to go back uh, to do uh, some physical exercise to kind of get the uh, blood fl- flushing again. <laughs> <laughs> and there's been uh, some some talk I've heard about something called the glymphatic system, which is like the lymphatic system processing lymph in the lymph nodes, but supposedly in the brain. Can you say anything about that and the role that yeah. sleep might play in neural uh, de- degenerative diseases and, and so forth. Yeah. So yeah, now this is a, a exploding area, and I have lots of colleagues who are um, actually working on that. Um, so the brain is really like part of this uh, interaction with the immune system is stronger than ever, and um, the immune cells in the brain called microglia. Um, has been neglected for a long time because, I mean, we neuroscientists, we like neurons <laughs> and we forget about the other cells. Um, but there are, uh, I would say, like a, a renaissance of the uh, glia cells, including the cells um, from the immune system. Um, and we, we know how important they are, not only on, on maintenance uh, of the proper function of the brain, but shaping um, your, your networks, especially during development. We are, we are seeing that with the organoid model. We are adding these uh, cell types that they currently don't have um, to the organoid and observing how it reacts. And, um, and the differences are dramatic, uh, things that we're never expecting. Uh, levels of synapses or, or, or the strength of the synapses are um, much different after and before you add, for example, these immune cells in there. Wow. So totally, totally important. Um, yeah. Okay, so now we've reached the segment of the interview before we go... <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. And we reach a segment of the interview before we go into the laboratory, where we go into the impossible, and we want to ask you uh, some existential questions, if you're willing to play mm-hmm. along with us, Allison. So the first one has to do with um, your far future. Hopefully, you reach the uh, biblically mandated age of 120 years old. I want to ask you, well, what kind of life advice or wisdom, not monetary or physical uh, mm-hmm. accoutrements, but what kind of um, ethical or, or wisdom you know, would you like to bequeath in sort of a, what we call an ethical will or zava'a mm-hmm. uh, in Hebrew um, to future generations, not, not just your biological progeny, but, but your ideological progeny, your students and so forth as well. What would you like to convey as wisdom? Uh, when you do depart uh, at, at age 120? <laughs> That's a great question. My hope would be like some kind of contribution about the brain understanding. And, uh, and to me, it's all about um, breaking the dogmas, right? I mean, in neuroscience, we start with a strong dogma that the brain is formed and um, does not change through life, right? It's immutable. You you are born with certain neurons. Those neurons stay with you for the rest of your life. If you lose them, there is no regeneration. Um, and I think the uh, the experiments that we are doing with the brain organoids show that this is a system that um, uh, it's way more plastic, uh, more uh adaptable than, than we ever imagined. Um, and if I can contribute to unlock that potential, I think that that would be like my legacy that I would like to, to leave. <laughs> wow. Uh, so a famous quote from Sir Arthur C. Clarke, you're probably familiar with it, that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And we always open each interview on the podcast with Sir Arthur actually saying that in his own voice. Thanks to my super producer, Stuart Volkow, for finding that somewhere on the internet. We also have uh, when when uh, Dave, the astronaut in 2001, A Space Odyssey, says to Hal to open the pod bay doors. The pod and bay doors. That's actually the origin of the word podcast comes from pod bay doors hmm. and into the uh, in, yeah. in, uh, Sir Arthur C. Clarke's uh, 2001. Anyway. What magical discovery? What's the most magical thing about what you've discovered as a scientist? And it may not even have to be your work, but what sufficiently magical technology is indistingu- or technology is indistinguishable from magic as far as you've uh, encountered? Yeah, uh, I would say uh, the first time that we generate these brain organoids with um, electrical activity on the same level as, as, as the human brain or the same trajectory. Right. I think that was a, a eureka moment and almost magical because we don't know how to explain. We still don't know how to explain. Um, and and it, it, it's kind of the data show us to us that we were wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we couldn't find the explanation because 
together with my colleague scientists, I was very skeptical. This is a tiny thing. Um, they're not controlling it. Um, they are variable. They are, I mean, really full of limitations, but it's still, they are doing something that the brain does. And I, 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 I and these days, I mean, I, I, I joke into the lab because there's so many people um, doing organoids. Um, you're going to see we have like a factory of organoids now. And I always joke with them that they take these cells, they kind of a kickstart the process, and then the organoids, uh, they become by themselves. Mm. Meaning that everything is genetically pre-programmed. The cells know how to migrate, where to position themselves. We don't have to do that. They they do it by themselves. Yeah. And I, I call that a miracle. Yeah. Because, I mean, how come? I mean, magic. you have like a stem cell and then you kind of uh, kickstart them to become like the nervous system and they would do it. Wow. So it's... It's a miracle. It is magical. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. You know, people only look at miracles as, as things that happened long ago. But in, in a certain sense, every breath that we take, every rainbow we see, these are all miracles to that be we get here. to yeah. witness. Yeah. That we have this short window of time to share together and to learn about the magic of the universe. Okay. Third question, penultimate question. Uh, name of this podcast is Into the Impossible. And it comes from Sir Arthur, uh, famous uh, statement that the only way of determining the limits of what is possible is to go beyond those limits into the impossible. I want to use that as a way to convey advice to your former self. Um, if you could go back and spend 30 seconds with your 20-year-old self, uh, what advice would you give to him to give you the courage to do as you've done to go into the impossible? Uh, I, I think uh, this uh, other self would just say, keep going. Um, maybe uh, trying to to be a little bit more open-minded um, because I, 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 and this is true for the scientists, especially in the beginning of your career, um, you, you care so much about the opinion of others. <laughs> and uh, if, if everybody says that, oh, it's impossible that an organoid will ever reach a level of uh, um, uh, consciousness or, or self-aware, well, it is really impossible that is. Well. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, if I just believe everybody, I will never do the experiments that I'm doing right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And that brings us to our final question, our final statement from Arthur, who said, um, when a uh, brilliant but and distinguished elderly scientist, I'm not calling you elderly, says that something is possible, they are most certainly right. Mm -hmm. But when they say something is impossible, they are very probably wrong. So I'm to ask you, Allison, what have you been wrong about? Is there anything you've been wrong about, you've, you've kind of uh, had second thoughts about, uh, that you've changed your mind about as you've become distinguished, though not yet elderly? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think there are certain... Uh circumstances where I could have moved forward if I would trust myself. And that's that's related to your previous question on, on the advice. Right. Care less about the others. Just do what you, I mean, your intuition is uh, pointing you to do it. Um, I think, for example, would have like better organoid protocols way earlier mm. than I thought if I would invest uh, my time because I would think that I would get there uh, earlier. earlier. And um, for reasons that, um, I mean, social reasons in science, um, force me to have like a narrow minded mm. at the time. So I'm learning along uh, as, as time passes how to, to avoid that. And one thing that I recently decided to do was kind of a, um, inspired, not inspired, but uh, a causality of the pandemic um, is uh, to go to less uh, meetings. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> less scientific meetings. Yeah, I am. Because when you go to these meetings, I mean, you see that everybody's doing the next step, right? And I'm, I'm, I never thought about uh, doing the next step. I want to do like orders of magnitude from where I am. Uh, um, but when I go to those things, I mean, I, I, I see that everybody's doing like one or two steps incremental, ahead. Incremental, incremental. Yeah, incremental. And I said, wow, I mean, if, if I force myself to be in the incremental group, I always going to be doing incremental science. I need to step away. <laughs> um, my colleagues might not like that, but um, <laughs> no, that's... Uh, that, end of the day i mean we all show the incremental stuff in these meetings that's uh that's that's important to make a real impact you need to go the you know order of magnitude sometimes and yeah. i want to thank you i want to say obrigado did i say that right go ahead good, yeah good, good. uh for being on the into the impossible podcast thank and you. for sharing so much of your your spirit and your intellect with the audience and i know this is going to be just a delight for them as it was for me so we're now signing off associate director of the arthur clark center for human imagination brian keating and my friend colleague Professor Allison Wautry of UCSD School of Medicine, Pediatric Cellular and Molecular Medicine. I think I got all that right. You got it. Rock star uh, all the way. Thank you so much. Allison. Thanks, Brian. Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic.